are. Welcome everybody to tonight's episode of Academy of Animated, uh, the Academy of Animated Arts. Ask me anything. Uh, my name is Mike Tanzillo. Uh, I don't. I guess I don't. I, I was told in the comment that I don't introduce myself. So hi, I'm uh, Mike. I am a senior lighting artist at Blue Sky Studios. I've been doing that for a very long time, eleven years. I am also currently running a global training initiative at Blue Sky Studios, which is a fun project of uh, we're switching pipelines and so I'm working to get the entire studio up and running on a new pipeline so that is a very fun project uh, tonight we're going to be talking about your demo reels and ways and tips and things that you should know about creating your demo reel that's going to help you get a job this is one of my favorite topics and this is an ask me anything session so feel free to add some questions uh, below in the chat window either on zoom you can just do it in the chat window or on Facebook, you can put a comment. Um, or if you're watching this much later on YouTube, put it in the comments down below and I'll, I'll, I'll type up a response there. So we do have some pre-written uh, questions coming in. So I will get to those. Um, some of them are demo reel related. Some of them are just general questions. I will do the demo reel ones first and then get to the general questions. But first, I just kind of want to take you guys through my, I kind of give a uh, checklist of things that I like to do when I'm talking about demo reels. I want to give people advice on their lighting demo reels. Um, so many people know that demo reels are about sh uh, showing your best work, right? Okay, not entirely. That's a start, but it's certainly not the main purpose of them. The purpose of your demo reel is demonstrating that you have the skills that to do a certain job. You want to give hiring managers and, and, and supervisors and whoever's going to be hiring you to do the job, the confidence that you have the skills and the eye in order to be an artist at their studio. They're looking to pay you a good amount of money to do this thing and you need to show that you can do it. So that's, that's the main job. It, yes, you're gonna be showcasing your best work, but you need to focus on the idea that you are demonstrating a certain set of skills that are gonna help you create this job. It's like a Liam Neeson taken thing. Okay, so at the top in your demo reel, the number one thing that, that you wanna see right away is a simple, clean title card. Very straightforward, your name, the position that you're applying for, and then like your email and or your website or a way of getting in contact with you, that's it. You don't need to list all the software you know, you don't need to have some kind of crazy motion graphics thing. I remember when I was coming out of grad school, I had this idea of like uh, making a light bulb that did a whole thing and then like it zapped my name out of it or something terrible. And then I remember somebody told me, they're like, nobody is going to hire you based on your title card. Just don't annoy them. Just put your name, put the relevant information, get it on there for a couple seconds, get it off the screen and move on. That's it. The next thing, and I'm kind of kind of go through like cut order of your demo reel. The first shot on your demo reel should be a wow shot. It should be a shot you choose. Um, it's like if you're putting together a trailer for a film, it needs to be the best shot, the wow shot, the one that you, um, you know, it's big, it's bold. This is their first impression of you as an artist. You need to start them off with a bang. You need to put your best work forward. Um, and oftentimes you are not the best judge of your best work. So that's what we're here for. So uh, let us know and I can give an objective eye um, in our Friday critiques and let you know, you know what your best work is. Because oftentimes you'll be thwarted by the notion that, um, that you know, something was your, either your most recent work and you're very proud of it, or it's a very personal project, or you just spent a lot of time on it. Oftentimes your best shot may not be the thing that you thought it was because you didn't spend that much time on it, but it just came together beautifully, right? Um, the next thing I always tell people when applying for a job at an animation studio is in your first couple shots, you want to demonstrate strong character lighting. Animation studios create, generally speaking, we create character-driven storylines, right? Main characters, uh, there are heroes, there are villains, and we wanna show that we create strong character lighting because that's the stuff that supervisors are looking for. Because that's often, if you're just coming in as like a junior artist, that's what they're gonna need you to do. Just some simple headshots over a pretty locked off background. And if, and if you can do that, 
that's great. And you can, you can demonstrate that, that you have that strong character lighting, that you can make eyes look beautiful. That's a big one. That'll really impress them. Um, and what I mean by like being able to demonstrate that you can do the job is not only are you showing that you can do it, which is important to them, you're also showing them that they won't need to show you how to do it. So it's saving time and that's what they want. Um, so, you know, we always talk about the three whys of lighting. Does your character lighting create strong visual shaping? Does it separate from the background and allow the audience to spot the character right away? And does it have mood? Does it have emotion? Um, and then if, if it's like a known character, you wanna make sure that it stays on its hero color. When you're doing environmental lighting, your main focus should be on the sense of scale because whether it's a, a Lego set and it's super small or it's a vast city landscape, you need to demonstrate in your environment lighting the ability to tell the sense of that scale because CG models are like, there's no scale to them inherently. Sure, there'll be texture maps that kind of give size cues or scale references. Maybe there's a character that's like a puppy, so you know they're kind of little, therefore this thing next to it should be rather big. Um, but really, it's, it's often told in the lighting cues. If your depth of field is too high, it'll look too small. If you have a wide landscape and there's no patches of light and shadow, it makes it feel much smaller. So you need to be able to communicate that scale um, to the audience and and really kind of uh, tell that as well. Um, the one other thing that I like to say is, you know, do you have the opportunity to, I, this, is, this is just always a piece of advice that I give someone who's looking on, you know, they're like, oh, what should I add in my reel? Take one uh, either well-composed shot or well-animated shot, a shot you really like, and light it three different ways. Light it in daytime, nighttime, and then some weird one-off thing or something like that. Show that you can take this one asset and, and, and really push emotion and three different feelings for that shot just based on your lighting. And it doesn't have to be a super complex thing. It could just be like a simple character, uh, you know, over a background and just like slowly have a camera uh, uh, zooming in or something. Uh, and that could be it. But what, what that shows is that you can use your lighting skills to tell a story. Uh, and, you can, and you can use it to enhance whatever story the, the director is going to tell, because that's something that, that they want to be able to see. Uh, when you do that, include the reference that you chose to get you to that point, because that's the other thing they're going to really want to look for, is can you take something, this came up on Monday, someone asked me about like an art director um, looking at your stuff, and you know, or I'm sorry, giving you the color keys on stuff. And totally, the art director oftentimes will give you a color key. They will give you references. They will talk you, tell you to look at stuff. Um, occasionally, they'll just tell you like, hey, make it look like a wormhole. And you're like, I don't know what a wormhole looks like. And then you just have to make it yourself. But what, when you're applying for a job, they want to know that you can take a, 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 an image as a reference and a model, and you can make that model look like the reference. Because it sounds easy, but it really isn't. It's a, it, that's where the, the, the skill of the job comes in. Lastly, you want to be able to show your individual individuality and your personality and your style. Um, this isn't something that's going to happen in your first project. This is something that comes out over time as you kind of create more work. It, you start to develop a style. I remember when I was... Um, I, I, before I got into CG, I was just an artist. I just, I did photography, I did some painting, and I was so desperate to find my style that I, I found myself just like mimicking other people. Um, and I found that when I, when I kind of just like let go and just started creating things that interested me, your style starts to form. And you can find that in your lighting as well. Um, with CG, you find things that kind of come naturally to you, things that interest you. Um, and what happens is, 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 Towards the end, when you're, when you're making your demo reel, um, you end up with these shots that are totally unique to you, that are unique to your personality, maybe your humor, maybe your background, maybe your heritage. And that will read through in your image because your audience will look at it and say, you know, we just looked at 100 demo reels and this is something that, that doesn't look like anything else that we saw. And they get the feeling that only you could have made that and that maybe you will bring that kind of special... Uh, feeling to the studio. I remember when, if you get a chance to check out um, 
my interview with, with Pixar's Becky Tower, she talks about that when she's looking for animators. She's looking for, she's not looking for someone who looked at a demo reel of somebody else that got a job at, at Pixar and just mimicked what they did. Um, they've already got that person. They don't need another one. But when you do something that's unique, that takes a little bit of risk, um, and it, that works out, then that's something that really stands out. And then the last thing is you just want to, you want to finish strong. Um, do you have a closing shot? Do you have something? Cause you, you, you wowed them at the beginning. You should demonstrated the ability to do the job throughout. And then you want to finish strong with your second best shot because you want to leave them with a good taste in their mouth. Um, here is like your opportunity to give them one last send off. Um, and then you just finish up with a simple, um, title card and that's it. Now, the other thing that I should mention too, and I think this, will, I, I left some stuff out of my presentation just because um, it comes up in the questions that were asked. But the biggest thing, actually let's get into the questions because I know that's in there. Um, well, let's see if there's any live questions right now that I should answer. Okay, so Clever asks, I have one. If I'm applying exclusively for lighting and comp, but few of my works I did more uh, than lighting and comp, like fur texturing and even some modeling, should it be mentioned or not? Uh, would it be judged for other elements too, or would it be only the lighting? Uh, I, I, I mean, you can certainly state all the other work that you did. I'll put it this way. You will be highly, you will be evaluated more on the work that you are uh, a stronger influence on than the work that um, comes out of a large group project and you only have a very small, small role. I actually had uh, one of the guys that I work with, one of uh, a supervisor who I, adore and I think he's great. Um, his biggest frustration when he's looking at a demo reel is somebody who's only got studio work, you know, who's only worked for the big studios and, and they're like, oh, I've been a lighting artist here and here and here. Um, because they don't get a sense of what they can do fully as an artist. Because sometimes when you're working in a studio and you get assigned a shot, um, maybe that shot's already been lit three quarters of the way by somebody else and you just need to go in and polish it up. So there's really no way for them to tell what you did or all you did was just copy somebody else's light rig and put in a shot and hit render. Occasionally that actually works and you don't need to do that much work. So they don't know if the, what they're seeing on the reel is, is truly your artistic ability. Now, if you demonstrate that with your own work, something that you created 100% on your own, like Unfortunately, I haven't made a demo reel in a long time because I'm very happy with my job. But um, if I did, I would include some of my personal projects on there so that somebody would know that I don't, I don't just have the ability to light for a studio. I can actually create things from scratch myself. So my advice to you is to just include in the, um, always include all the things that you were responsible for on a project um, because you never really know. Like sometimes studios are looking for people who are multifaceted to be like, okay, we want them to do lighting, but there's some downtime in lighting too when like stuff's being animated or assets are being built. And it's really beneficial if you can also do fur. Um, so I would definitely include that. Just don't, don't put anything on your reel that you only did fur work for. You know what I mean? Like don't show them something that's not relevant to the job. If it's relevant to the job and other stuff, go for it. But if it's only like, Hey, I animated this and you're, you're applying to a lighting job. They're going to be like, why They're, they will question your decision-making as opposed to what you actually did. Uh, one other live question here on, on zoom and I'll check out. So Niha asks, what should an ideal lighting compositing demo reel be? Uh, what should it have? Should we include more character lighting or BG lighting, realistic or cartoon still or animated? Also, uh, what a look to have a texturing demo reel should look like. Um, okay. Let me start with so i kind of listed the things that it should have um you know like you should definitely have so you should have both you should you should show your diversity of both character lighting and bg stuff but if you had to pick one definitely do character lighting uh, but you definitely want to be able to show like i said the sense of scale in a bg um more uh realistic or cartoony um that's up to you i i like to show um a couple different examples, like stuff that's a little bit more abstract and stuff that's a little bit more realistic. I think a good variety is nice because it shows that you can, uh, and again, this goes back to the reference imagery. It shows that you don't, you're not just a one trick pony, that you can read a reference and you can analyze that and say, okay, I understand what's happening in the shadow values. I have, I understand what's happening in the key values. I, I understand 
what the material properties are doing, and I can replicate that in 3D. And that's, that's extremely, extremely valuable to them. So um, lame answer, but a little bit of everything or is, is your strongest bet. Um, I, I've got a feeling that we're moving a little bit away from super realism in animation. The stuff that I've, I've seen and the stuff that I've uh, worked on, um, it seems to be more like art direction. And I, I think this was a big turning point was like Spider-Verse because that was an, a much more abstract thing. And, and the rest of us in the industry were kind of hearing stories coming out of Sony that were just like, oh man, we got this project, it's crazy. We don't know what it looks like. We don't know what we're doing. We're just like, you know, everything's in comp. We're just trying to figure it out. And then you saw the product and you're like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. This is great. And then I think other studios are, aren't as afraid to make that leap now. Um, in terms of what about a look dev and texturing demo reel, um, I have less experience reviewing those, but what I can tell you is that you want um, uh, turntables of your character. You're going to want to show that process, right? You're going to want to demonstrate the, um, uh, you want to demonstrate that you have the ability to take something from start to finish on a look dev and that you can, again, match reference uh, and, and create a finished final polished image. So turntables are big on that. Um, from what I've seen, it's like, you know, you show your reference, then you show your turntable, the final, and then you show it in action in the shot. Um, that would be, because that kind of tells the story to the audience. You're like, oh, this is what they wanted to do. This is what they did. This was the final product. Uh, Adrian asks, to note about the previous question about adding other stuff, uh, I know programming, and if I built a tool, might not be complex. Could I include that too? What, would that be helpful to studios? Um, yes. Yeah, so what, it's, not, it's certainly not um, a deal breaker if you don't have those skills. I, don't, I, I can't code anything. Um, I can write simple Linux commands, but that's about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it, again, think to yourself, always be empathetic to the audience wh who's going to be looking at your demo reel. Um, you know, think about it, like get in their shoes and, and, and think to yourself, will this make this person a, will I want to pay this person to do a thing? And if this makes you more valuable to that company, then great. Because again, writing code uh, can be helpful in a studio. It's, again, it's like, it's like fur. It's, um, it's something that they can have you do if in, in a pinch. Um, and they know that you can help in tool creation and tool testing, which is important. And you do have some technical skill. Is that going to get you the job? Nope. Uh, the artistic skill is, but having this stuff and, and having uh, some additional knowledge certainly will help. But again, just make sure if you wrote a tool, uh, make sure it's, it's lighting related when you apply for a lighting job. If you just wrote a tool that um, helps duplicate some geo across the scene, like that's kind of, again, that's kind of something that, that isn't, isn't applicable to the job and isn't quite as, as necessary there. Um, okay, let me go ahead and those are those two questions there. Let me hop over to Facebook to see if we have any questions in the live session here. Um, Holly wants to know, should you, should you include professional work even though the professional work isn't as good as your personal projects? You should include the best work, period, regardless of the, um, uh, regardless of the media or the, where it comes from, right? Like you should show, because they can see on your, re, on your, on your resume that um, you worked at a studio, right? They're not going to not believe you. Um, but I've worked on projects way back in my career that I didn't um, feel that the artistic direction that I was getting was the best. And after that project was over, I said, thank you very much. And I, I never, I never put that stuff on my reel. Um, because, you know, like, again, your decision making of what to put on the reel is on display as much as anything else. So if, if you have like six really good, like really beautiful pieces and a seventh one, a seventh one that, that looks bad, even if you have like four, like let's say you have four pieces that look great and one that looks bad at the end of it, they're going to be like, you know, that one that looked kind of bad. Like, do they think that was as good as the other ones? Because that's question, that's questionable decision-making and that's not a hundred percent fair. Um, but that's how they're going to look at it because they're like, man, did they think that that was as good as the other stuff? Like that has me questioning their eye a little bit. So I would say that um, if your professional stuff holds water and 
you're proud of it and you think it looks great and you show it to us or you show it to somebody else that you trust and they're like, yeah, that's, re that's really great. Definitely add it. Um, I know all the work that I've done at Blue Sky has been, I'm very proud of it. Um, but I could see it. I could definitely see a scenario where you're like, you know what, the sequence I worked on, it's not, I, I, I hit all the notes and I got the director's approval, but you know what, it's not, it's not my best work. So I wouldn't feel pressure to do that. Um, some, okay, so we've got some preloaded questions. Uh, Sylvain, uh, so we've got some people, unfortunately. So I do these late at night just because it's the only time I can dedicate to doing this with a, um, uh, a son that's noisy most of my day. And also I'm, whatever. So some people in Europe, I, for you guys, I, I should make a point to apologize to anyone in Europe and in Asia um, and in Africa and the Middle East. I'm sorry that these are in the middle of the night. And so I will make sure to always get to your questions um, when you post them ahead of time. So Sylvain says, ideal duration for a demo reel, less than a minute, less than two minutes. Super maximum would be two to three minutes, but I don't look at that when I'm looking at a demo reel. I look for um, like the best, like if, if there's the best work possible. Um, I would say a sweet spot, if I had to say anything, would be like a minute and a half. Um, if I was making a demo reel, I'd probably go for a minute and a half to two minutes. Um, because that's like, that, that's, that's, you've got the audience engaged, you've got them checking stuff out and then, um, uh, you can, you can, and then that, that leaves them with a little bit, you want to leave them with just like a little bit of wanting more right now. Um, the biggest, most important thing about that is do not add inferior work to your demo reel in order to hit some sort of like ideal um, duration because that's not what it's about. It's about having your best work. And if your best work only means 45 seconds, then by God, man, make it 45 seconds. Um, you're not going to impress anybody with the length of it. Um, especially if it's like an entry level job and you're just coming out of school, they'll look at that and be like, yeah, this stuff was great. But you know, clearly they're, you know, they've only been doing this for a few years, so they just don't have enough time to like to make more stuff, but I like what I've seen and that shows potential. Um, so yeah, so there's that, uh, music or no music. I say music. Um, lots of times we'll turn it off, like we'll mute it, which is fine, but like Lots, sometimes we don't. And I, you know, it just, it looks better with music over top. The only thing you want to look out for is using copyrighted music. If you're posting it to like uh, YouTube for sure. I don't know about Vimeo, but YouTube for sure has like an automated thing that will police your audio and will take it down if it, if it infringes on copyright law. Is it better to be simple and efficient or to make nice transition effects? Uh, when you're reviewing a show reel, what kind of transition do you prefer between two steps uh, of a breakdown? And what are the transitions that annoy you? I just prefer a very simple cut um, because the wipe will take longer. Anything else just takes longer. And um, when I'm looking at my own work, I always AB stuff or I will look at one image, then flip to another, then flip back, then look at another. Um, and so I'm very used to looking at things that way. And when things start to wipe, uh, the wipe can be distracting. So just, just a straight cut. Don't let it cut to black. Um, between the frames, like go, go, cut, 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 cut. Um, and the other thing too is to make sure in your editing software that the cuts are uh, at an equal increment. You know, so it's like if you if you're if they're a half second, make it a half second each. Um, I'm not sure if the half second is right. I, I I don't have that information, but like you know, whatever feels right to you, make it beats, make it da 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 da. What drives me nuts is when it's like da 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 da, like it's like it kind of gets jarring. So allow your audience to sense the rhythm and you can easily do that in like, you know, whatever, edit, you know, even if it's just iMovie, you can see the bar is the same length as the other one. Um, let's see what else we have. Do you prefer when there is a bit of time uh, between steps to have the time to take a look at you before, do, or do I prefer quick transitions and pausing when you need to? Um, I prefer a, a little bit of a slower transition because I don't, I don't always have time to go back and look. Um, so if you, if you feel like they're too fast, they're probably too fast. So just go ahead and slow it down just a, just a touch. Should I show all the steps one by one or group parts of the composition together or compositing together uh, in a steps? Like if uh, I have three successive color corrections in Nuke, should I allow all three steps or only one step that shows all three color corrections? I guess it depends. Yes, it depends. But 
air, air, again, uh, and I'm going to keep going back to this to the empathy of the viewer. Um, if you're stepping through stuff and there isn't an obvious change, the audience, like I always look at that and like, wait, what just happened? Um, you know, if it's like some like minor spec hit in the background, um, you're not going to see that. So you're going to want to clump that together. I usually say like five or six buildups is good because you just want it to be like, here's the, you know, here's the shot and then bop, 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 shot again, go. Like, don't, you don't, you don't have to show every ambient occlusion pass. You don't have to show like everything, just show it like in it's in a simple form and then make it more, 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 more go. Like don't show every color correction. Don't be like that, 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 like it starts to drag on after a while. So just like five or six steps. Um, you can just say color corrections at the end or compositing at the end. And then, and there are a couple different ways of, um, of doing, of doing a breakdown, right? There are breakdowns and there are buildups. There is a, uh, and, and by the way, this is, I should have said this at the beginning, always, always, always play the shot through first before you do a breakdown or at least part of the shot, because you want the audience to know what the final is before building up to it. Because if, if you just start building something up, I don't know what we're, what we're, I don't know what the goal is. Like, I don't know what we're aiming for. So it, it has to be like, play the shot through and then dot, 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 dot. And then I'm like, okay, I saw what, what the goal was. How did we get there? Right. Um, and, and, and yeah, so you just want to always make sure that the changes are kind of obvious when you're stepping through and that, um, and that you're showing cool stuff. Like, and, and you can, when you're stepping through, sometimes it's like, Sometimes it's layering it. Sometimes it's like you're showing the background, then you show the character, then you show the volumetric light, and then you show this. Other times it's like showing the, the you know, you're showing that, that you have a key light, and a fill light, and a rim light, and a blah, blah, blah. Um, and you can, you can do buildups that way. So think about, there, there's, there's a couple different ways that you can do the buildups too. And it all depends on the shot, like whatever makes the shot look cool. Just like make it cool. They, people want to see cool stuff. Um, okay. Let me see if there are any other questions that are demo reel related. Um, oh yes, Leanne agrees with Holly. That is a very good question. Um, I just wanna see if there's any other demo reel related questions before, because we have a couple others that are not. Oh, okay, here we go. Oh, Nicholas asks, I can never tell what to compare my work to to gauge if it's good enough to be taken seriously. I often feel like I am immediately getting passed over. How can I tell if I'm headed in the right direction? Well, that's what we're here for, unfortunately. Um, and that's the reason, one of the big reasons why we, why Jasmine and I created uh, TDU and the Academy of Animated Art is that um, we, it sucks. And we know, um, we know that it's, that the hardest thing, especially early in your career is, is, you know, if you're getting into lighting, it's because you have a good artistic eye already, right? Like you have an understanding of that. But you also are going to be making work that you don't know if it's good enough or worse, you know it's not good enough, but you don't know how to make it better. So the only way to be sure is to find people who, who have been through the process, who have seen demo reels, who have gone on college recruiting trips and seen, you know, I, I don't know how many lighting reels I've seen at this point, but it's a lot. And I can tell you, um, I can tell you what that, you know, and, and Nicholas, I've, I've seen, I've seen your work. You've got professional level work already built up. So I can, I can tell you without seeing anything, you are going in the right direction and your work is very good. Um, I can only say that because I only say that when it's true. Um, I will never ever allow any of my students or anybody that I, that uh, I take, that I, that I, I review their, their work or their reel um, I will never let them show bad work. I will never let you put something up that's not professional that I don't think will help you get a job. If I don't think, if I, Nicholas, if I didn't, if I didn't think you were a, a good artist, I wouldn't have said, I wouldn't, I don't blow smoke up people's butts because it does not help them. The best instructors I've ever had in my life, the best mentors I've ever had in my life are people that are honest with me, whether I like it or not. That I, I, I walk away from those conversations like, man, they don't know. I, I, I know I've got this in me. I know I can do this. My, one of my favorites was I was, in, I was in school and I showed something and one of an instructor who I adore named Bridget Gaynor um, was like, Mike, that's just, it's too saturated. It doesn't look good. 
And I was like, she just, and I, I, I remember going home that night, like she just not know what she's talking about. And I got home and I looked at my image and I just like desaturated a little bit. And I was like, yeah, you know, she was right. Like she was totally right. And I, you, you need to find people that have been through the experience and people that respect you enough to be honest with you. Because if you show it to your close friends, if you show it to your significant other, if you show it to, they're going to tell you that it looks great. Um, and not because they're lying to you, but because they love you and, and they want you to be happy and they want to tell you the thing that you want to hear. So it's very important to get feedback from people who have, who have been through the process and can be honest with you. Um, oh, we've got a couple other here. Uh, Niha asks, uh, what helps in understanding the colors in darks? Should we practice more photography? Also, um, besides references, painting the scene and software before you start working on 3D helps. Yes. Um, so the best way to understand color and light is um, some, there's, there's composition stuff, there's design stuff that we talk about in our courses. Um, photography is good. Painting is better. And I'm saying that, again, as a, somebody who studied photography and works as a photographer for a long time. Um, you will understand lighting in CG more from painting than you will from photography because photography, you're so limited to light in the natural world. Where painting, all you have to do is kind of stick to the rough guidelines of light so that the audience believes that the lighting is true, but you can, you can craft it in any way that you want, very much like CG lighting. And I know CG, like renderers always talk about how realistic they are and all these bounces and ray tracing, blah, 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 blah. That's not what it's about. That's just, they're just trying to sell a product. What we're trying to do, like we break that stuff all the time in order to create the best looking image that we can, much like painting. Um, and the best way to do it is just to do it a lot, man. Like I, I, I tell people this all the time, um, you know, like you just pay attention to the things that are visually inspire you. Your, whether they're advertisements, movies, uh, bus signs, graffiti art, whatever, like take out your phone, snap a picture of it, put it in a, put it in a folder, save it in one spot. So you can kind of go back and like analyze like what, is, what about this do I really like? And then you can start breaking down colors and you get a better understanding for it. But if you don't feel like you understand it totally right now, it's hard. Give yourself some time, give yourself, be patient with yourself and allow yourself to develop those skills. And besides reference painting, does uh, it help to, to paint on a 3D scene? Yeah, totally. Um, it helps you get a, get a feeling. If you have that skill, yeah, it totally helps you get a better understanding of what you're going for. And you don't have to match that perfectly, but you can start to get like uh, a sense and you can even, you don't even have to like do perfect, like you just block it out with color and composition. So you can start to know how that composition will fit together. Um, how about fading between images of a breakdown? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's not, uh, I'm not crazy about it. I mean, <laughs> It just, it just kind of takes a little bit more time. Um, if you're doing a build, I, I guess if you're building up and you're like this and then it fades into that and it fades into that, that's okay. Um, but if you're showing layers, if you're like this layer and then this layer and then this layer, just cut. Because again, these things are snappy, right? These, they, they, it's like, think of them as, as a trailer for a film. You're not going to get a lot of fades between cuts on a trailer because it's like dink to dink to dink to dink to dink show you this, talk about this, get you to this, blah, blah, blah. So you, you, you want to kind of think like, like that. And again, it's not rushed, um, but it's, it's, it's fast. Um, so I, I would, you can, you can do fades, but I, 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 I would, unless you know it's good, just stick with cuts. Straight cuts are never going to get you into trouble. Um, and you have, yeah, like, like the buildup is like turning on lights. Totally. Yeah. It's like you're turning on one at a time. Up, 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 up. And then you had a little depth of field, and then you had all this. I love breakdowns; they're great. And you can find a billion of them on uh, YouTube from companies. Look at companies' breakdowns of like the effect sequences on Game of Thrones or whatever action movie just came out. They have, they'll usually have some really cool. It's like companies like MPC and The Mill, um, ILM, like all these companies will have really cool live action ones, and you can kind of kind of start to study those a little bit. Um. All right, let's see if we have any. Okay, now let's start getting into, yeah, let's start getting into some of the other questions that came up, uh, some non-demo uh, non real specific stuff. So, uh, 
Uh, what has the biggest impact on your decision when you need to choose someone for a job? The CV, the cover letter, the show reel, or the portfolio? Uh, the show reel, or the portfolio and demo reel. Your work. Your work is all we care about. Um, I, I will, I don't even look at the CV or the cover letter until I see the work. If the work's not good, I don't care where you worked. I don't care like how long you went to school. I don't care where you went to school. Unless you can do the work, your, your CV is secondary. So all your, your work is the number one thing. Sorry, I meant to get to that one earlier. Um, not demo related. Okay. What are the differences between a junior lighter, a senior lighter, a lead lighting artist, et cetera? What kind of tasks uh, do each one do during their day? Um, so every company is a little different, but uh, a junior, a mid-level, I, I can speak from my own experiences at companies, a junior, a mid-level and a senior level artist, um, all light shots on the film. Uh, generally those, those titles are split up by complexity of the shots. So seniors will just have more complex shots than juniors. Um, they will have to have more responsibility. Oftentimes in sequences, there are these things that are called one-offs, uh, which, is, which I don't know if that's the official term, that's just what I call them, where it's basically like you have the main sequence where things are happening over here in this part of the sequence and all of a sudden like the camera cuts to way over here and you see something you've never seen before, but it needs to match all the lighting over here. A senior will often be given something like that because that takes a little more skill because you don't, you generally at that point have to create a brand new rig because the default rig that was built for all this stuff over here won't work when the action happens over here. Um, but in terms of full transparency from what I've seen, the, the terms junior, mid-level, and senior are, um, are a, a way of paying you differently. Um, if everyone was just called artists, um, and there were just people that were better at it than, than others, um, it would be really hard at a company to, like let's say you came in um, and, your, and the lighting supervisor, or the, the, your boss, the head of lighting was like, oh man, you know, uh, Sylvain's doing an incredible job and I would really like to, to give them uh, a, big, a big raise. Um, the people that control the books and, and the money oftentimes at companies will say like, well, uh, for merit-based increases, we can give X percent of a raise. And like, yeah, but they really deserve more than that. Like, well, you know, the only way that we can give more is if they're promoted. So they came up with these junior, mid-level seniors as a way of giving you promotions in order to pay you more when you deserve it. Um, that's, that's, been, that's been my experience. So some, so some of those are, are pay-based. But they, but they do correlate to the level of skill of shot that you will be asked to do. Um, and leads are different from, in my experience. And again, in some shows, they're called supervisors or some companies are called supervisors. Sometimes they're called leads. Um, they're called different things, but, but generally speaking, a lighting lead is in charge of a sequence of films. Um, and they, they will, or a se I'm sorry, a sequence of shots. Um, so if, if you're, if, and this is traditional, sometimes it's some studios, again, this gets uh, changed a little bit, but traditionally, uh, the way that it works is, you know, there's, there's a film that's an hour and a half long. Those films are broken up into sequences that take place in different parts of the film. So it's like, um, a sequence of, you know, like these two characters are having, um, an argument inside their bedroom. Uh, so th that sequence will be all the shots playing out that argument inside that bedroom. It could be, you know, 10 shots, it could be 50, it could be 150, it could be 200. The lead is assigned all of those shots and the lead will set, uh, the look of that by, by generally lighting a few shots from that sequence and establishing the look, establishing the color palette, establishing all that stuff and working with the art department who is giving you paintings, but the lead will actually build that light rig and actually build all that for you. But the light lead won't do that for every single shot. That's where the lighting artists come in. So once the lead has established that for a couple, then a bunch of lighting artists will, would be, will be assigned that sequence. Not always a bunch, but more lighting artists will be assigned that sequence and then the lead will divvy out assignments amongst all those artists to uh, light each shot based on their master rig is roughly how that works. Um, so, the, the lead, uh, so the jump between a senior and a lead is a, is a pretty big one uh, where a senior artist 
Um, and, and, and so a lead is generally more leadership, a little bit more managerial stuff. Um, depending on who you are as a person, this was something I didn't get uh, coming up, was that I was always like, I was always an, an achiever, right? Like you wanna get the best grades, you wanna get the best this, the best that, and of course you'd always wanna get a promotion. But for some people, being a senior artist is that sweet spot, right? You, you're trusted, you get to light whatever you, you get to light really cool stuff, and you don't have the added burden of being a manager of people. Uh, you just do your thing and you can help people out, but like generally speaking, you're just an artist. Where a lead is for people who, who like being uh, leaders. Sorry, that was kind of a long-winded answer. Um, and I hope you guys are sticking with me here. I know this is getting a little bit longer than I usually do these. Um, related to the previous question, what is a hierarchy in a lighting compositing department? How long can it take to move to a superior position? Um, it depends on the company. Again, sorry to keep saying that, but like generally speaking, there's like, um, uh, it goes, you know, like a, let's say there's a junior level artist, mid-level artist, senior artist, then there's leads, which are in charge of sequences. It's, let's do it that way. So junior, mid-level, and, and uh, senior artists are, um, are responsible for shots. Leads are responsible for sequences. The lighting supervisor is responsible for the entire film, the look of the entire film for the lighting department. Um, above that, usually uh, a lighting supervisor will report to, you know, at, at that point, then it's like your VFX supervisors, your CG supervisors, uh, your art directors, and then ultimately the director. So that, that's like the ultimate hierarchy. It's like, because at the end of the day, you're making a film for the director. And then uh, Adrian, you asked, uh, not demo related, I'm spending time on school assignments, but some of them have diminishing returns. I feel like I'm losing so much time when I can be doing other things. Any advice? Uh, yeah, uh, I totally can relate to that. As I mentioned before, I was, I was a box checker when I was in school. I just, I was of the firm belief that as long as I kept checking those boxes and doing all the things that my teacher said, I would, I would get a job someday. Um, I didn't know anything about CG or animation or, and I didn't know that that's where I would end up. Um, I just thought that like, if you just kept doing the assignments in school and you kept getting A's, like you're doing the right thing, right? If I had to go back um, to when I was younger uh, and um, if I had to go back and tell myself one um, piece of advice at that point in my career, it would be to figure out a way to complete the assignments that, were, that I was tasked with, but do it in a way that gets you a better demo reel because that's, that's, what, it, that's what it's about. So whatever, you know, like, and, and you can talk to your instructors. Most, most of them are, will be totally cool with it. If you're like, hey, listen, I know, um, let's say like you want to, I don't, I don't know, I can't, I'm trying to think of an example. Like you want me to model this thing, right? The two, I totally will, but here's the deal. I really want to be a lighting artist. And that's what I want. I know that's what I want. So for my assignment, I would like to maybe twist it this way. Um, because again, you're right. And, and I can't believe you noticed it at this point while you're still in school. It took me longer. Um, that your time is your most valuable resource and you want to dedicate that to the most important things. So I'm never going to tell you to blow off your assignments for school because getting your degree is very important. Um, for your personal growth because you're already spending money on it and it's, it seems like a good opportunity for you. But um, I would always make sure that you're positioning yourself to get the career that you want because that's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal at the end of the day, I couldn't even tell you what grades I got in school or what projects I completed in most of my classes, looking back. Um, I remember the stuff that I put on my reel. I remember the stuff that helped me get a job but I don't, I don't remember individual assignments. They will fade into obscurity pretty fast. So make sure that, yeah, may, I would say, make sure that, you're, that your head's in the right spot. Focus on using your time to create the demo reel that you want to create a, to get a job. Uh, okay, so a couple more questions. All right, I love this. This is a great topic. All right, I feel good. If someone isn't straight out of school and hasn't worked in animation before, can it be more difficult for them to get in the industry? Nope. I did it. I, I didn't get into this industry until I was like 27. Um, uh, no, is the short answer to that. Uh, most of the people that I work with didn't, didn't do this straight out of school. Um, 
also there's unique experience. I, I actually like it when people have some, uh, yeah, you were me 11, 12 years ago. I'm 39 now, 12 years ago. Um, except for you're more talented than I was. Um, you, uh, no, it doesn't hurt you. I, I love people with more life experience. I, I were, up until then, I was in school. I was bartending. I was working in art galleries. I was trying to get my own work shown. That stuff, that like, you know, I guess five, six, seven years uh, before I got in this industry, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am without that stuff. And I, I think I needed that life experience. And I, and I, I also know, um, yeah, is 50 year, years old too old? No, nobody cares about your age. I swear, I've worked with people in their 60s. I work with uh, 20, 22 year olds. Nobody cares. Do, do the job. Make art. Make it cool. That's all we care about. We don't care about uh, gender or race or any of that stuff. We, we're, we're a performance-based industry. You do, you do the job, you're in. You're easy to work with, you're in. Just don't, if you're a pain in the butt, people won't like you. That'll be a different way. That's another thing. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's totally fine. And like, I just talked to uh, uh, one of the guys who we have that we're working with, a guy, Chris Begoria, and I'm hoping to bring on and, I'm, and if, if, I, if I bring him on for an interview, um, I'm questioning whether or not I should tell the story. Basically, he worked in a hand grenade factory for a little while. Like he put the pins in hand grenades and like that was a job for him for a little while. He's a brilliant rigger, brilliant modeler now. Um, we all have weird paths and, and um, this industry is filled with some misfits, people who took a little while to find their path. Uh, and so we, we respect that. We don't, we don't hold that against anybody. Um, let's see, no worries. I'm still listening. Take notes. Great. Uh, if some textures and shaders, uh, does not look good in the lighting and needs improvement that goes back to look dev or texture artist, or does a lighter change it? Uh, depends. Depends on the studio. More often, more often than not, like I'll just, uh, if I can, I'll just go ahead and tweak that. Um, if it's a major, major change, I will, uh, you know, you, you talk to the shading artist and they'll probably make the improvement, but if it's like a matter of increasing the specularity or the bump or something simple like that, I'll just do it. Um, and, and truth be told in many studios, the textures and shaders are done by the lighting artist, which is why we teach it, which is why Jasmine teaches it. Cause she did a lot of that when she was working, um, on film and commercial work. She was also the, the shading and, uh, texturing artist. Um, so yeah, so it's like shading and textures work hand in hand with lighting. So if they're not, you know, you have to tweak both of them to get the final look right. Uh, all right. A couple other questions. How long do you have to work as a junior lighter? Oh, that's right. Okay. So that was the other one. Um, there's no set period of time. Sorry. Let me read the question out in its entirety. How long do you have to work as a junior lighter until you are considered a mid-level or senior? It all depends on the company. So companies have head counts, right? So when those positions were made, senior, mid-level, junior, um, companies allocate money for each position, you know, like X number of dollars to pay mid-level artists, um, X number of dollars to pay seniors and juniors. If there's no, if there's no head count, if there's no space, uh, they're not going to promote you. If you have the three people above you leave, um, sometimes that'll create two openings or three openings. Uh, then you can slide in that. It's all about the opportunity of that company. Um, so there's, they, they definitely, definitely will not say you're a junior for two years and then you'll be a, a mid-level for five and then you'll be a senior after that. And cause also that, that's, again, that's not how we work. <clears throat> there are people that I work with that get promoted very quickly because they're super talented and their work is great. Um, there are people that I know that worked, that I worked with for a very long time that are still a uh, junior or mid-level because that's where their skill level is. And, and like I said, it's, it's a very great, um, it's a great equalizer of our industry is that it's all about your work and, and what you can put on the screen. Cause again, most of the time we're in dark rooms anyway, so it doesn't really matter what you look like or how long you've been there. It's like, who's putting that work on the screen. That's good. Let's get them. Let's make sure we put them in a position where they're making more money and they're happier and we want to give them more opportunities. So, uh, how long of a break do you have between each film? Um, generally speaking, Speaking, well, none real. I mean, like we, we have ebbs and flows. Um, generally speaking, studios will be like, I think we're, we're, we're trying to do like an 18, every 18 months. Um, we, we release a film. And generally speaking, you 
as a lighting artist, your, your ramp up time starts maybe six to nine months before release and then finishes two months before release. Uh, so you're slowly building up through that time period. Um, so, ab but then, but there is a time after a film is complete, uh, where you're, you're, and again, this is only in my experience where you're kind of like, you've got some downtime to really start to like explore on the next project. Um, also to travel a little bit, like, cause you've been, you generally will have worked a bunch of overtime, uh, leading up to the finishing of a product to a project. So usually what I do is like, I, you know, I work 60, 70 hours a week. So I finish the project and then it's usually a few months where they're, they're not going to tell you to take a break. Some companies do like some companies are like, okay, your contract's over. Goodbye. We'll call you when we're uh, ready for the next project. Um, but oftentimes, uh, but for me at a company where you're staff, you, you light, you finish lighting, you, I take like a month where I'll um, travel, spend time with family. Um, and then for the next six months or so, you slowly start to ramp up into your next product project. Uh, you'll do some lighting tests. Uh, you'll do some look dev stuff. You'll develop new tools. You'll help. Um, you know, if you're lucky, you'll help in other departments too. You can, like I said, so the question of helping in fur will come up like, like, Oh, you know, fur, you can go help for that character. I know like at blue sky, the, if you saw Horton, here's a who the main villain of Horton, here's a who the fur was done by one of the lighting artists. Um, we have lighting artists. Like if you pay close enough attention in the credits of a film, you'll see people listed multiple places on my record is I've gotten three credits on one film where as a, what are they? Lighter compositor and sky artist, I think. Um, the, yeah. Yeah. So that's, and, and, yeah, like Spies in the Skies, I got two. I got, I, I, I led some stuff and I was also an artist on some stuff. And so I got both credits. So, uh, yeah. Has there been any big changes at Blue Sky since Disney bought them? Um, we're still, I mean, we were, I can't talk too much about um, Super Inside stuff just because I have an NDA. Um, but I can say things like we are, we, we were developing a new pipeline before Disney bought us. Um, and we, we, we have had a few minor changes here and there, but we're still working on the same projects. Um, we're, still, we're still making the same films. It's just a little bit about the way that we've done it is different. Um, and we were updating our render, our, our pipeline anyway. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, no, not, not too much has changed um, between, between the two projects. There was some, we had some worrying with some hand wringing about that whole thing, but Disney's are, like, it turns out Disney is a really, really great company to work for. Um, turns out they've made some great films in the past and they know how to do it well. So um, it's been, it's been a really, really positive process to, to work for Disney now. All right. Let's see if there are any other questions before we sign off here. But I think if I, Oh, Leon asks, if I come in as uh, from TV to feature what I start over as a junior lighter, possibly. Um, it's, it depends on your skill level that you demonstrate in, in your TV work. Um, and, and to be clear, starting off as a junior, isn't the worst thing in the world. It just gives you more opportunity to get raises. Um, and I, cause I know that like, if, if you're going from one, uh, if you, if you're if, even, even as like a supervisor at one company and you're switching companies, oftentimes you will, uh, you'll go to just be like a mid-level lighting artist until you learn the ropes and you can ramp back up. Um, I, I, I think, I think if you have some good experience and you have good stuff on your reel, probably not. You probably come in as a full level artist uh, or a mid-level artist, I should say. But, um, but if, if you've just been doing it for a few year or a couple of years and you know, like the stuff that you've done on, on for your TV spots, isn't quite in the same style that they're looking for. Um, but they see some potential there. They'll bring you, they could, they could offer you a junior spot and then, and then build you up that way. There's no, set standard rules to this stuff, especially the junior, mid-level, senior. It's all, again, it was all kind of, uh, from my personal opinion, it was all created to, to help people um, get raises and promotions and um, by creating a, 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 a more tiers and more opportunities to move, move people up and down. So, yes, okay. And then how many revisions a shot usually do you get until it gets final approval on average? Um, like three, I would say. 
usually you get, um, so like you, you get uh, like for most shots, if you're, if you're like a lead, you'll get more because you really are defining the look. <clears throat> if you're a shot lighter, you generally get like, you know, you get like a week to do three shots, say. Um, and generally speaking, you'll like, you'll take the Friday before to start breaking out layers, setting some stuff, some basic stuff, maybe copy in the light rig, maybe make a tweak or two and send it off to the render farm for the weekend. And then you get it back Monday and you're like, okay, this is what I got to work with. Okay, let's go. So, you, so not a hard and fast rule, but generally like Monday, I'll, I'll adjust my light rig based on what I saw over the weekend. Tuesday, I'll show it, get my first round of notes. Um, Wednesday, I'll, you know, maybe I'll take that as a work day and I won't show in dailies that day. Um, and then Thursday, Thursday, you show again for your next round of notes. And then Friday is your final approval and they might, um, they might have a note or two here and there, and then you just kind of finish that up and you go out the door. So generally speaking, you have like three cracks at it. Um, but they like, there's nothing that says that that's it. They want to make sure that what you're, what you're seeing is the best product. So, um, if it's supposed to be approved on Friday and it's not good enough, they'll say, okay, we got to do this next week then. And then you go on from there. Okay. Final question. And then <clears throat> I'm going to lose my voice. Okay, job security is a big concern uh, to this industry that I love. Getting a staff positioning is like winning the lottery, it seems. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, that is the hardest part about this industry, is the short-term contracts of many of the companies. Um, it used to be that you could just be in Los Angeles and hop around from show to show, um, but as companies left Los Angeles to move to Vancouver, Vancouver seems to be the place where people are often doing that. Um, you can also do it in New York and, and in London are the big places for that. Um, like in New York, you, like I have a staff position, but many, many of my friends work in the city and they just hop around from, you know, MPC and frame store and the mill and Panda Pan, and like all the small studios. They'll just, you know, bounce from project to project. Um, but yeah, job security is, is the number one, if I could change something about this industry, I could, uh, I would. But um, all of that, it's, start, it's starting to change, I think. I think it's going to change with, um, I think that's going to be an effect of, of, of this um, pandemic that we're going through, is that maybe, maybe not necessarily more staff positions, but you'll be able to work remotely more. Um, and so you can work for a couple of companies, like you can work for companies from home. Um, and the thing about contract work is that, uh, it's, it is sustainable if you're good, if, if you've created a good reputation for yourself. I know a lot of people that work just on contract hires and they actually, I know some people that really thrive in that, um, because they're able to kind of set their own schedule, take scheduled breaks from stuff. Um, but the, the thing about, uh, the thing about that is two things. One, again, with COVID, companies are going to be looking for more remote work because like, they're going to have to create further separation of employees. You can no longer pack a whole bunch of people into, um, into an open office setup. You have to face people out by six feet, and that's, not, that's going to be very expensive for companies, so they're going to want to um, have people working remotely. The second thing that this thing has taught us is that content, man, we are starved for content, especially content for kids. Um, I, I talk about this a lot, but like all the major studios are still there. Uh, Disney, Pixar, Sony, Illumination, Blue Sky. Um, all the major companies are still making films. Netflix is now making films. Amazon's making films. Apple's making films. Um, Hulu. Everybody's making original content because they want to get in front of that content game. Uh, so while... I don't know if staff positions will be more in demand, but there will definitely be more opportunities coming up. Like Netflix alone, I forget the number, but leading up, coming earlier this year, they announced they were spending something crazy, like $17 billion on productions for, for original content. And with COVID, animation is the one industry that is consistent. We don't need to go to, on a film set. We don't need to you know, fly to... Scandinavia to shoot Jon Snow. I made a lot of Game of Thrones references. I don't know where that's coming from. We don't have to be on set. We don't have to be around a bunch of group of people. We can, we are the only 
entertainment industry arm that just kept right on rolling with this thing. We took a couple of days to make sure everyone had computers at home and all the software they needed, but, but we just kept right on trucking along. Um, where feature films kind of ground to a halt because they can't shoot anything, right? Okay, so that's why I'll leave that there. I, I do think that um, while, uh, while that is the biggest struggle of this industry, I do see a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel and I do see some um, positive movement on that moving forward. So, um, so like I said, for these sessions, guys, I try and be as open and honest as I possibly can. Um, so yeah, so come back next week. We'll have another topic. And in the meantime, uh, keep posting your questions. And I'll make sure to hit them here. All right. Happy lighting everyone and have a good night. Thank you all.